Nice to see you all and welcome today to Conversations for the Future. This will be our final segment before we break for the summertime. So after today, you can see us back in August of this year. We'll give everyone a little break to do all of the fun things that people do in the summer, unless you're some Southern Hemisphere, then I guess it's your winter. So welcome everyone here. We talk about space, we talk about the future of space, and we are so excited to have an amazing speaker today who is also dear to my heart, a good friend, someone I've been through space kind training with and someone who I have collaborated quite a bit with. Uh, Mal Malkawi is here today from Borderless Labs and he will be uh, speaking to us in just a moment about space money and space finance. Um, Mac is a successful entrepreneur and business person and he is making waves in the space industry. So we are so excited to have him. Another reminder that we're streaming live right now on LinkedIn, and we will drop that link in the chat in case you have anyone who wants to listen who can't make it into the Zoom meeting right now. And then also we are recording for YouTube. So you may see a cozy audience here in Zoom. Do not be deceived. We have quite a few listeners and uh, friends and colleagues who are listening live right now and also who will be catching up on the YouTube recordings later on. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce, there's the chat. The LinkedIn uh, link is now in the chat. So if you wanted to share that with anyone, you can. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Mac Malkawi. Mal, as I said, Mac is an amazing entrepreneur in the space industry. And uh, Mac, I'm going to hand it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Tell us what you stand for, who you are, what you're doing, and go ahead and start your presentation. After your presentation, we'll go into a Q&A, and it seems like we um, have a little extra time today. So Mac, if you go long, it's okay. And then anyone who has a question, please put it in the chat or be prepared to raise your hand at the end of Mac's presentation. And also, if you're listening online, just throw your questions into the comments section and we'll try to get them to Mac today live. So Mac, Malkawi, Borderless Labs, welcome. Thank you, thank you, uh, Rebecca. Oh goodness, it's uh, I've known you since we, we uh, have been doing Space Kind together, Space Kind Four, and uh, uh, that was really the uh, gravity assist I call it in not only my career but also my business, and to to be able to to, to talk not just uh, space and everything that that we value in this industry, but also to be able to talk business with people who understand having so many diverse industries talking to each other and business, I believe, and uh, uh, for, for small businesses, was never a part of the equation. Ah, sorry, I stepped on my cat. <laughs> and uh, uh, small business has never been a, a part of the equation, at least to this level uh, of today in the space industry. And a lot of small young entrepreneurs, they want to do something, they don't know where to start, where to begin, or uh, there's the, also the big taboo of you can't talk about money, you know, <laughs> and that's something Rebecca and I were reminiscing about. It's still in our culture. Don't talk about money. And yet we want them to be successful entrepreneurs. So I kind of had to go the long route of trial and error to do that because my program as an outreach program started off as just regular philanthropy in 2016. I was going back home to my home uh, uh, country of origin where my parents immigrated from in Jordan. And there were all these Syrian refugee camps over there. And I figured, oh, I want to find them. The, the, the young Einstein or Lady Gaga or, or, or um, it, you know, Steve Jobs that's in that refugee camp and just offer science, you know, camps and, and fairs and social activities and try to do, do those things as philanthropy. And it got so successful that I figured, oh, let's do it again the next year. Then it got too expensive that I figured, all right, let me try this. Uh, non-profit route dabbling in philanthropy here and uh, I figured let me do this amazing video and I get all these people to write checks for me and then I quickly realized I'm getting into a realm I had no idea what, how non-profits worked I had no idea how any of these people did a, 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 any of this ra raise this money you know how to beg for money and I came from a business world petroleum equipment contracting and I figured, all right, I, I'm going to, in 2018, I figured I have to revamp my entire program and actually follow 
what I know how to do because I don't know how to do, I don't know how to beg for money. I know how to make a product, not to make a great product. I know how to market it and I know how to sell it. So I figured, why don't I just do that for this program and have the proceeds fund that program? And that's what I did. I started seeing what is this industry in that area missing? I grew up as a consumer of documentaries. I just adore Carl Sagan and Cosmos and Neil deGrasse Tyson and anything. I could just watch National Geographic and Discovery all day long. And I know tens and tens of thousands of nerds in those areas as well who would 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 also love that. But they don't have any of that content in their own language as original content. I was growing up, Carl Sagan was playing on at television in the Middle East, but it was in English with two lines of translation in the bottom. No women, no uh, cultural representation, no linguistic representation, nothing. So only people who understood English or the people who, I mean, I think we've all watched enough foreign films to know that those two lines of translation might give you the idea, but not everything. And how often, can, how many foreign films can you watch one after the other after the other before you get that headache? So if you don't understand the language, you don't understand the culture, you're really not going to get it. And if you don't see representation of your own culture and language, then you really don't feel like this is for you. So I figured I'm going to actually empower those creators. And I'm going to create those documentaries on science and space and marine biology and all these wonderful, uh, amazing documentaries that I grew up watching. And I'm going to hopefully see a young generation of uh, documentary filmmaking or STEM loving uh, 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 generation growing up because they were inspired by all those creators that they saw. So that was the, 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 the mission and the uh, business model was the sales of those documentaries will help continue to uh, uh, to make this sustainable. And of course, as a business model, what you, what you have to do, you have to make that awesome pitch deck. Of course, you have to show an MVP, a minimum viable product. You have to show a proof of concept. So I made a bunch of documentaries in multiple languages, English, Arabic, Spanish, Hindi, Urdu, and Bengali. Uh, and we, uh, I made the trailers and I made the posters and I went to a number of investors and I pitched for uh, seed funding and I raised 500k. And for that, that's the money that I used to film the rest. And now in the, I'm in the process of post-production to sell what I have like three and a half million dollars worth of IP right now that should fund tons and tons and tons more, more content. So that conversation is not a conversation I hear a lot in space startups of how to pitch, where to find the, the, the money, how to even speak to VCs and angel investors. And when you do, how to be well prepared because you only got that one shot. And engineers and, and scientists in the space industry are just so brilliant. I adore them so much. But I need to make a um, uh, to make a point here. We've all seen that politician who tries to speak about climate change or about science. And oh, look, I'm seeing the smiles right there. <laughs> and we know how cringy sometimes it, 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 to hear that politician try to talk science or try to talk climate change is just so cringy. I really need the science and space community to understand that when some of us try to talk business to the business community, we can look just as uninformed and we need to recognize that we got to be prepared, as prepared as we are in our sciences. We have to have our business skills, our marketing skills, all of that. It, in, in other words, we need to invite business people to speak on our behalf. We need to get artists. We can. Get, we need to get marketing people and everything to actually pitch on our behalf. And that way, we could raise the money the way it's been raised for hundreds of years. We can actually, you know, run our programs, show that, uh, show that MVP, and actually social social uh, traction or sales, as, as we call it, and then a business can operate just like any other business. 
So that's the model that worked for me. And did not necessarily a, a lot of uh, people are trying other models. I'm just saying what worked for me because I have failed otherwise. But that's the um, that's the model that worked. And uh, uh, with the proceeds of that, the process of doing all that, I empower just so many people to enter the industry that you would never imagine that those people, the way they look, they, they don't look like they belong in science or space or or, or uh, engineering or anything. I mean, even in North America, it's hard enough to see a mechanical engineer as a woman. So imagine uh, a young woman from Bangladesh wearing a hijab who's a mechanical engineer who's actually an expert in her field. That is the, the, the those are the stereotypes we're breaking. And this is the business prop, profitable business model that enables that to happen. Um, and uh, in the process of doing all this, I have met a lot of people like Terry and Rebecca and people from the from the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences. Here, I'll share my screen and and show how we how did we get here. Everyone's saying, okay, so how do I do how do I do that? There are an awful lot of programs out there. Uh, for example, oh, wrong epics. So I started doing my own human spaceflight training with the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences. So I'm actually wearing an IVA suit here built by Final Frontier Design, which became Paragon or bought by Paragon, which is now actually uh, building for uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lunar uh, space suit for Axiom. Right now, we're doing capsule egress training here, and we filmed this in Arabic and English and Hindi and Urdu and Bengali. Look at those flags. So this is not something just five years ago. You see from the Dominican Republic, UK, India, Jordan, Mexico, Colombia, Canada, the United States, South Africa. This is what this is how we're going to go to Mars. This is this collaboration of all this talent from around the world is going to go to Mars. So to think that the Easter Bunny only put the space talent of the world in North America is is uh, unreasonable. And I think when you empower these people, you get amazing magic that happens. This is the these are faces of diversity, men and women equally, and 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 countries from all over the world. And no one cares where you come from. Everyone just cares how amazingly brilliant and talented you are in sending us to space. We got to fly with Jared Isaacman on his fighter jet over here to do uh, astronauts for the Polaris mission over here, the Polaris Dawn uh, mission. So all of this, all these experiences really came from, um, you know, th this love. Here's a documentary we're making about this plane going down to Latin America and doing science fairs on every uh, every stop. Blink is the name of my company. Got to do zero G flights with Cyan and our very own ba Bailey Burns wearing my own suit and of course you meet uh, amazing people from Boeing she, she's uh, uh, Amanda's the uh, uh, launch campaign manager for the Boeing Starliner CST-100 and in July she'll be sending two astronauts to the International Space Station Tim and Rochelle Ellis Tim owns a company that uh, is called Relativity Space and he was one of those people with a pitch of if I can 3D print a rocket of this metal spool you know um, he called 50 people. He was in this conference, no, in the, in the analog astronaut conference last year, he was telling me that he called and emailed and guessed the emails of 50 people before one of them said, fine, here's a check. And now he's raised one and a half billion dollars for his company, Relativity Space, with a valuation of four and a half billion so far. And all within the last few years, you know, and all it took was that business model and an excellent pitch and uh and and i don't want to say fake it until you make it but it was nothing but a powerpoint presentation until people gave the money so it was an idea until he made it now that money is making it happen they just launched their terran one uh, uh demo flight that actually the first stage completed the second stage failed to ignite and i'm very uh you know proud of how, how they did that uh, Chris Sombrowski went to the international, uh, actually went on the Inspiration 4 mission, got to do the zero-G flights with our uh, with our costumes here. This was actually made in a refugee camp. 
And I'm getting to do uh, EVA training now with the International Institute of Astronautical Sciences and all the life support systems, CO2 and cooling systems that have to do with that. Now, all of that is cool for me as a person, but what does that mean? Why are, why, uh, oh, why am I showing all of this? Is that I get to include now people like this, people like this young woman over here, Salam, who has never been on a plane before, let alone been in the United States, now gets to talk to her culture, her people, the young women in her, uh, in her country get to hear about the, the starship that's gonna launch, that's gonna send humans back to the moon, it's gonna send humans to Mars, you know, while she's on site doing the, that documentary filmmaking. So that is um, wonderful outreach, but it doesn't pay the bills unless you find a business model of making that happen. And I hear so many of you with outstanding outreach initiatives, even far, far more impactful than mine, but it hurt, breaks my heart to see that there is no business model behind it, that we really need to have this conversation about uh, if we don't know how to do the business, then we need to recruit, you know, that that business person who can who can help us, uh, you know, in, in that regard. And um, I'll just wrap up by showing you the video. Uh, I might have to stop sharing and start sharing again to do the audio. Please tell me I was sharing this whole time. Yes, you were sharing this whole time. <laughs> love the picture of Salam. Love all the pictures Thank of. You. All the all the suits that you've worn, Mac. There we go. I see your video. Oh, and those were real face suits, man. So this is the documentary of, uh, this is the, the trailer of the um, documentary that we're filming for the uh, analog space camp that we did in the country of Jordan. So I'll pause and play throughout, but... So I know this is not inclusion or outreach. The only thing I want to say here is that I'm 48 years old and 240 pounds, and I still managed to pull that off. So it's not too late. <laughs> inclusion for the dad bod there. <laughs> I was very, very proud of that moment. And then, and, and, um, um, and it's never too late. So this is Salam here. Salam you saw in that picture, and she uh, here is scuba diving next to this wreck underwater, and we're simulating an EVA in space. Nothing to me simulates space training, like you're already weightless. You're already uh, life and death away from not being able to breathe within seconds, and you're using life support systems here. They're called scuba systems. And this time last year, she was just learning how to swim. And... You know, and then we got her scuba certified, and now we're going to do documentaries about Shark Week and marine biology and all this amazing stuff that's going to inspire hundreds of thousands of young women who look like her and dress like her that, hey, I can scuba dive one day. I can do all these. I can fly a plane one day. I never thought, they would never thought it was an option for them. Everybody, everybody know so when I asked to do documentaries in that part of the world, the UN and the um, and the embassy are looking for me to tell the sob story of the refugees and they're, they they want to give me the the amputees and the people who've lost all their loved ones and I'm like no I'm trying to do a party here I'm trying to show hope and happiness and and how science and technology engineering arts and math are going to be you know your uh, this is going to be your future and you belong in here and 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 we're going to make it one big happy party and that was very weird to them that that area of the world can, can have this kind of content so it is a risk but this is the the strategy i i decided to follow space 
for me, it's like an open hatch to discover the unknown. So this uh, suit that they built, this is part of the spacesuit design challenge that they built. These aren't costumes like you saw us repelling down the, the uh, or the one you have, I have right here behind me. This is an actual life support system that has CO2 monitoring, CO2 scrubbing, thermal regulation, cooling system, fog mitigation, redundant methods of fog mitigation, all the science, engineering, arts, and math that they go into a fully enclosed pressurized system is going into this. And it was developed by young women who engineers, basically, who look like this. And those stories really need to be highlighted. I have just landed on Mars. That's how I felt. Uh, one of the most impactful parts of that camp is one thing I didn't expect which is I want to give everyone, uh, give everyone the experience of welding. Welding steel is one of the coolest things I've ever thought, you know, I've always wanted to do. You know, you're driving around and you see the sparks flying and someone with the visor in front of them. And I was like, wow, I've always wanted to do that. And I wanted to give everyone that opportunity that you can weld two pieces of metal together and there's science behind it and there's you know engineering and artistry behind it. And this is what it's like. And now to see young women wearing a hijab welding pieces of steel together, I never thought that that imagery by itself is uh, was going to be more impactful than a lot of other things that I thought were going to be impactful. Just a, a woman alone welding, let alone a woman wearing a hijab in that culture, welding uh, is just that image it speaks for itself now you have young young girls who are in the middle of nowhere know that that's an option for them if they choose it i want everyone watching this show to get fired up and feel inspired and say hey that can be me one day a lot of these people did not know how to swim before then, and now that it's done. The closest you'll ever get to an EVA on Earth is definitely scuba diving. I recommend it for everyone. It's not about the opportunity, it's about you. You make the opportunity. So this rover that you see here is not an RC car. This is a one-to-one -one scale of uh, the Curiosity and Perseverance rover. It's got a weather station up here. It's got cameras, depth, 3D. There's a LiDAR over here. There's cameras all over. It does 3D mapping by itself, and it's fully autonomous because they programmed it. Uh, one of the, this young gentleman over here, Iraqi guy, programmed it because he said because of the time delay, because of the speed of light between Mars and Earth, if I just try to control it with a remote control, it won't be the real thing. I have to give it AI commands that if it sees a rock, it's going to go around it. All I have to do is say point A to point B, and it'll autonomously make it to point B. So this is a real engineering model I'm super proud of, and it's going to Saudi Arabia next week to be presented at their space authority. And much faster than, <laughs> than curiosity and, uh, and perseverance. Space Nutrition, we, her and I, her name is Amina, and I uh, qualified for the latest round of the NASA Deep Space Food Challenge that was won just a few days ago by our very own friend Barbara and her team at Interstellar Labs for their pods. But for us to be able to, to have a, uh, a study and a paper about microgreens and juicing and snails and protein and every and and to even just qualify for the NASA Deep Space Food Challenge and be able to present that not only here but she got to come to the Analog Astronaut Conference and present her work as well. So I'm super proud of all of them for that. Flight simulators. I mean, it's uh, she, this young lady named Sarah. Um, uh, who built this flight and is inspiring kids all over the country to want to be pilots someday. Look at those habitats behind us. Those are actually domes, and each one of them has an airlock. You open the outside door, 
when you open the inside door, the whole facility collapses. You have to open it and close and then open the inside door. And it's uh, it's it's a great analog for what Mars, and it looks like Mars. How cool is that? Humanity's curiosity and constant need to learn and explore more is really inspiring. So this might be a hot air balloon, but look at, tell me you don't get the overview effect. If you've never been in the air and a kid and you see this, you only see Mars. This is incredible for to have every, give every one of them the opportunity to be able to see this and have this, I call it a Venus analog because it was in a hot air balloon, but it's a, it's a memory of a lifetime for all of them. And the amazing science they learned in the process of being up there of knowing that these are actually sandstone rather than, you know, limestone and all the ge geology and why this is red because of iron oxide and why the horizon looks the way it is and the geology behind all that and the, the long shadows that we're going to see and, and when we make it back to the moon because we're going to the south southern poles. They're never going to forget that because they learned it in the most amazing, amazing scene. And they have to bring in a part of their culture, a little falcon, Arabian falcon with 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 the rover is just something that I really want to to empower the culture as well. Cultural dancing as well with some Western dancing. The Dead Sea and the Dead Sea mud <laughs> and the adventures in the canyoning exploration. Not exactly Martian rovers, but it was pretty cool. It was pretty fun. Absolutely phenomenal. Like, I can't stop smiling. <laughs> and that is the uh, trailer for our uh, space uh, analog themed camp that uh, will be premiering in Arabic and English and Hindi and Urdu and Bengali hopefully uh, as soon as I can find a buyer <laughs> for it <laughs> which is why I'm going to Saudi Arabia next week which brings us back to that business conversation which is that was a huge expensive investment but the one sale of one language is a 10x return. So imagine all the languages sell. Wow. Your time. Wow. What a compelling video. That is so beautiful. And I'm sure you get this same response, this huge smile uh, after you show anyone this video. It is so powerful and so beautiful. And I was personally happy that I knew a lot of people in there just from being involved in the space community, Mac. This is an excellent example of what you can do with your skills, your talent, your background uh, in, in, a, in a profit sense, in a for-profit sense, and how you can turn it into something that's great for the space community, for space industry, for our future in space. And yet it's not for profit, or I mean, it is for profit, it's not a yeah. nonprofit. And so you're not going through all of the, the barriers that nonprofits have. So Wow. Congratulations, Mac. That is amazing. So I have one, I have a bunch of questions, but my first question for you is, how did you learn how to make these videos? Um, right now, I'm a businessman, not a filmmaker. So I, uh, YouTube videos is how I learned to make <laughs> them. But um, um, as I do more quality, high, um, uh, high dollar uh, value, value film, that's where I just hire the filmmakers to do them. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but Google and YouTube are how I learned myself. <laughs> but for the for the high quality stuff, just like I said, you need to bring in the business person to talk business. I need to bring in the proper filmmaker to actually and, and hire the filmmaker to actually do yes. the filmmaking, not facilitate all that as the yeah. uh, um, as the president of the company. Wow. And so you're pitching this to uh, to the Saudis. Well, you're... Uh, so I already pitched and already won, actually. Uh, so that's why I'm going to Saudis to to uh, have a pilot program space camp that, uh, that they're going to be hosting and supporting as a pilot project so we can uh, move it to the entire country. So one of their themes is they want to bring space um, 
to their uh, science curriculum. Uh, they want it to be a full part of the curriculum because they, they have a new space uh, looking for 2030 vision and agenda. Mm -hmm. And just like Kennedy had in the 60s, a let's do this within the decade, um, Saudi Arabia has a 2030 agenda with like nine giga projects. Each one of them is like 500 billion or a trillion dollars. Um, so when, when they can invest $500 billion in a ski resort in the desert, but what's $150 billion on space? <laughs> so uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to get in with pitching. Like I said, and it was hard and it was a lot of preparation and it was a lot of to pitch this to, uh, to start. Of course, we got a lot of other things to talk about, like human life support systems and Right now, they're just, they just yesterday sent, or the day before yesterday, sent two uh, uh, astronauts and the first woman to the International Space Station from that region. And um, so they, they've proven that, you know, they're going all in, they're willing to make that investment. But as a consumer culture there, um, they, they hire the professionals to do it. And when it comes to the space camps and the outreach events for their youth, I think that the, this video just demonstrated that I can achieve that for them. Wow. Uh, wow, Max. So I have another question for you. And just a reminder to our audience, uh, please put your questions either in the chat, raise your hand if you're here live with us in the Zoom meeting. And if you're on LinkedIn, go ahead and comment in the comments section and we'll get your questions over to Mac. So Mac, this is, a, this is a, a, a prime example of how to do business. You find your target customer and you, you, you direct what you're doing to your target customer. So walk us through how you figured out that the Saudis had so much money and that they would be, a, a, they had a need, which is kind of sales 101. You find the need and you fill the need. And so Walk us through for those of us who are just learning this concept of, of for-profit business. Uh, how how did you how did you figure all this out? You know, two years ago, three years ago, when you were starting this. Oh no, I, I didn't have the Saudis in mind, UAE, or anybody in mind when I was doing this two or three years ago. Two or three years ago, I just wanted to make documentaries and basically sell the documentaries, and and knowing that that region doesn't have a lot of competition because there's no STEM documentaries. They're all in the English language and translated or um, or dubbed in the other and it's bad dubbing. It's one person for everybody, and it just, it's it's just insulting uh, almost. So people just don't watch it. There's not a lot of views there, hence they don't get the scientific knowledge, let alone learn it in their own uh, language. Um, so I just made it the product and uh, and for the camp because I wanted to do this kind of outreach and I knew I could pay for it by, by, by selling it. The byproduct of that was uh, a business person telling me, hey, oh, by the way, Saudi Arabia is really going all in on this space thing and they don't have any camps. Maybe you should pitch it to them because what you have would work for them. So why don't you come over to a conference called LEAP? LEAP conference in Saudi Arabia it stands for One Giant Leap. And... Uh, so we went to this conference and, and and the only other Americans were there were Cyan Proctor and Christina Corp and Tim Ellis. I just showed you his picture and um, uh, a, a number of people and a bunch of space kinders like ourselves who have that vision as well. And the, and everybody else, the rest of the, no Boeing or Lockheed or SpaceX or Blue Origin, no one. The rest was absent. I mean, so I, I found like we're, we're very U.S. centric and we don't, you know, uh, so the invitation was extended, but only a few Americans decided to go. Two astronauts and Cyan was one of them even as a, uh, as a private astronaut. But everyone in China was there and they hosted the event and they sponsored it. Ross Cosmos was there and they were trying everything they could to, to be able to, to capture and capitalize on a lot of this human spaceflight stuff. And India was there and they signed contracts with launch contracts with India, but we were absent. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was lucky that the U.S. market just is not. How do I put this? The they're not in because they're not inclusive. I was lucky that I didn't have the U.S. Con the, uh, competition, <laughs> um, but I had to compete with the Russians, the Chinese and the uh, 
and the in Indians. So I get launch rockets. So the in India signed a lot of contract for micro launches for their for their satellites. Um, I'm hoping Tim Ellis, you know, got got a, got some good traction and contracts to, for for launches through Relativity Space, and um, for the space camps. And I think no one was able to show the video that I did. So I beat out the Russians, the Chinese, and the uh, Indians, but uh, nobody else. You know, if Space Camp, if Rocket Center, uh, Rocket Science Center in Alabama had had uh, quoted that, I don't think I would have stood a chance against them. So yeah. that, that's why I said I went to this conference where they're telling the world we're open for business and we're looking for you know your talent mm -hmm. and. Um, when when this when this I was ready after years and years of doing this, it wasn't a hard video to put put together to to uh, uh, to pitch it. So uh, there is a lot of survivor's bias of being at the right place at the right time uh, for this contract. But for the last six years, it's been you know a struggle to manage to show that value. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's an overnight success that happened over, after six years of struggling. <laughs> I was just going to say that it's like Starbucks. People are like, oh, Starbucks, like they boomed overnight. No, they had 20 years behind them. And so it's the same thing where you you have the preparation and you're going, 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 and you're going at your lower, slower level. And then, bam, some big opportunity hits and you have already the mindset and the product. And all you have to do is, is accept and then run with it. And wow, Mac, that is a really astounding. And way to go from a business perspective of, being uh having your your radar on to see where the opportunity was and i i know you i've seen you the way that you network with everyone you talk with everyone you visit with everyone you go to conferences all year long you're you're uh, collaborating and working with everyone and you're always working really hard and that is really the the capstone of an entrepreneur is that you know it's like there's this saying that when you own a house and a business the work is never done like you're always working on your business, just as if if you were a homeowner, you're always working on your house. It's never finished. You can never rest unless you allow yourself to rest. So Mac, I wanted to ask you, walk us back to um, to how, you know, the person that's just learning, how how can they how can they maybe consider switching from something that's nonprofit to something that's for profit if that maybe will get their their skills and their their product out there faster perhaps that's a better option for them what advice do you have for someone who really doesn't know anything about entrepreneurship i was lucky because i did understand the for-profit market i mean i had come from you know going on weekly sales calls you go on 20 uh, sales calls over a week and you get 18 no's and two yeses and the two yeses you know cover the livelihood of our 48 employees and their families so but that is not something you can just tell someone that is something that came over 16 years of grinding and and blood sweat and tears so I I was fortunate enough to be able to come from that so I had the grit to be able to to, to uh to be able to pull that off. I had the knowledge to be able to understand and know what a pitch deck is and what, and, and how angels and inve investors, uh, venture capitalists and seed investors or just friends and family basically would understand. And, um, and, and I, I still went through the failures. I still tried to show the value to the investors of what, what I'm doing when all the investor wants to know is, you know, it could be lipstick or it could be, you know, it could be documentaries. At the end of the day, there is an expense, there is expenditures and there's a profit margin. And if you don't show those numbers, you're not getting my money. Yeah. You know, so it's just, they're looking at spreadsheets. They're not looking at outreach. And I'm still trying to sell the outreach. And that's where I failed every single time. But when I sold the spreadsheet, when I sold the spreadsheet and the numbers made sense, things started working. So I had to humble myself to a point where I'm so passionate about the outreach, but I had to understand my audience when I'm speaking. I had to understand my, I had to read the room and it took me a while to get that. Yeah. Um, so what I would tell someone just starting out is you, you could have the best, you know, uh, you know, 
product in the world, you have to understand your numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why metrics matter. And that's mm -hmm. if you're asking for people's money, people are going to um, ask, you know, for clarity as to where that money is going to go and how they're going to get that money back. Yes. I think that's such a good point, Mac, especially for, um, I mean, space is one of the sectors like this, but in places of the economy where it's pushing into the new, there's, you know, those people on the forefront believe in it. They're, you know, it becomes part of their identity and it almost feels like a betrayal to talk the numbers. And when they talk to investors, they're like, well, why don't you just believe? It's like, well, this is JP Morgan Chase. They believe in 7% a year. <laughs> like um, that's that's their guiding star. And so I think it's important to, uh, you know, that knowing your audience, you can still believe, you can still talk the numbers. Like that doesn't change you. Um, just know your audience. Well, and the, your pitch to the investor is totally different than your pitch to the embassy is do totally yep, different yep. than your pitch to the to the camp or it's totally different from your pitch to the UN, you know? So when, uh, when, when you're trying, we're going through just getting the permits to pull this off was insane. Yeah. So that pitch had nothing to do with numbers. That pitch had everything to do with um, empowerment of the locals, empowerment of the, the people who were, were going to take credit for all of this stuff. And, exactly what you said tim why don't you just believe we get emotional we get passionate we get attached and uh that what i was successful at was having different pitches to whoever i'm speaking mm -hmm. to yeah yeah and this business pitch and i haven't given you the business pitch yet that totally hardcore rip your heart out and chew it up for dinner pitch is uh, is music to their ears yeah. but um uh, and uh, I will, yeah, if someone wants to compete against me in this, I will destroy them and I <laughs> will take their business. And uh, showing that confidence is what they wanted to see. Yeah. But it conflicts with the outreach that I want to do of empowering the locals and everything. So it's, it's, it's always a different uh, conversation based on who you're talking to. And it sounds so disingenuous to, to, to speak on both sides of your mouth or something like that, you know. Uh, but, but it's but, not. But, that's the thing. Yeah. But it comes with experience that right. that doesn't, you can't, I, I don't know how you can teach that. I, you just have to fail and get, get let down 20 times, a, 18 times a week and yeah. be told yes, uh, uh, two times a week for a decade or so to build that grid. That's why when we go on sales calls and sales meetings and everything, everyone is in their forties and fifties. I don't yeah. have the, and because this is not something you can teach. Even when you do go on some of these um, Tony Robbins type stuff, you know, he'll try to motivate you as much as he can. But I don't, I don't know what can substitute experience. So the answer would be hire the salesperson who knows how to sell, hire the business person who knows, or collaborate with them or partner with them or something. If your job is outreach, if your job is to deliver the product, if you're an operations person, do your operations and let the business person take care of the business. Everyone needs a CFO for a reason. It is hard to let go of your money, but mm -hmm. if you don't have a CFO, things fall apart really quickly. You know, so um, and 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 having that uh, humility is uh, one of the hardest things of an entrepreneur to do because it's your baby. Mm, yeah, yeah. Leaving yeah. your baby with a babysitter, right? Without a nanny cam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean, there's been studies showing that like, you know, most successful companies are founded by people over the age of, I think it's like 35 or 40. Um, and it's for exactly this reason that um, it's not that those people didn't try starting ones before. They ground them into the ground and learn their lessons because uh, they were not the sort of people who were going to learn by just listening to other people. Um, they learn from that and doing. Um, there's, uh, yeah. It's, Chris uh, in the chat is asking a question. I feel like yeah. the lunar lander concepts uh, of lunar cargo needs to be explained to investors out of asking money, not needing the time being. 
Uh, is there any risk that may be interpreted the approach as money raising effort uh, for which the short pitching uh, slot needs to be observed? Uh, how to set up pre-raising meetings, any advice? Um, right now, Lunar, uh, there are a number of companies that want or private companies that are trying to send lunar payloads uh, in, into space. The business models that I've heard of is lunar mining, uh, helium-3, uh, lunar solar power, um, and beaming it back to Earth. Um, those are hard sells to investors, but a more successful sell to investor is I have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, all of these countries with a ton of money that they spend on just, you know, um, a fraction of what they spend on a party like that could actually be a lunar mission. So to say this country has finally put its, you know, flags on the moon, a private company could probably have a lunar, a funded lunar lander mission and they can have the prestige of being the first country in that region to place a woman on the moon a man on the moon that kind of pitch i think would to a government would be more successful than um future technologies that don't even exist like helium-3 and mining the moon for for settlements and bases that that that, that are going to be so so those those are sound pitches but not for today's money i mean for for an investor to give me money today for me to tell them hey look i'm about to pitch this to qatar just spent 250 billion dollars on hosting the world cup and now they're looking for something that big to so so when i tell them what do you say we do an all-female mission to the moon and it's going to be from Qatar and it's going to be Arabic women from that region and every young woman in that in that region is going to be inspired that they're going to be the astronauts of the future. They're the ones who are going to go to Mars and let's pitch and it's going to be a fraction of what it, it costs to go to Mars. SpaceX already has this, everything. Let's $5 billion, let's make it happen. You know, that is a pitch that is more sound than let's go mine the moon for helium three or, you know, I, I don't know. That's to me, I can make that first pitch. And I think another way, um, so like for a lot of these early stage, you know, 10, 15 year out conversations, you, um, you know, you do need to be talking with investors and getting that feedback of, Hey, what is it that you would invest in now? Maybe there's something related to that, or it's a technology spinoff of what you're doing. Um, and I think it's it's fair to ask investors if they have feedback on an idea you have, um, and just you know white papers or stuff like that. I've never left. I mean, I heard that I learned this from Peter Diamantis, who heard no a lot of times before the X Prize when when he got the the money from Anusha and sorry for the X Prize. And until I started adopting this, I was repeating the same mistakes, which is every time you hear a no from an investor or from a buyer or something, always, and I've always started to ask, what have you needed to hear in order for that to be a yes? You know, what, where, where did I fail? I don't tell them where did I fail? What, what would you have needed to hear to, to see the value? Where did I fail to show value? And yeah. one after the other, after the other, of course, you know, two out of every five people tell you. Some people will really tell you. you oh, know, yeah. buy food and drink. They want to talk and they want to share, share. But you know, yeah, I just don't see the value in what you're doing. Or I don't care about that region or that culture or something like it. And I, I got and my money's all tied up in stock. <laughs> but you know, if you showed me your team, if you showed me your 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 CFO, I mean, you're dealing with an accountant. You're so small right now. I need to talk to CFO. I need to talk charts and numbers with, with someone. And yeah. you keep talking women and women and women, and inclusion, 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 culture, culture, culture. Like, I, I need a CFO to tell me, this is the money you gave me this quarter. This is what we made so far. I yeah. need a five-minute conversation here. I'm getting a headache just hearing. I get I get it. But th th that conversation is what led me when I finally was asked the question of why am I failing to... to, to uh, to resonate with you is when I started refining my pitch to them. So if I hadn't asked the question, you no, know, 
what would have what would you have needed to hear for, for that to turn into a yes i wouldn't have gotten that feedback on mm -hmm. you keep selling inclusion when i just need a cfo to talk to about quarterly earnings you know <laughs> yeah well and a lot of times you're closer than you think um and um when you force that investor to articulate their reason for no um either they do have a reason and you would want to work with that person or they don't and maybe you don't want their money because you, as much of, as you want to fund your venture you also want that person to come alongside as an advisor open up their network and if they can't even tell you why they got to know maybe they're not going to add value anyway and i have one of those and i regret it and uh uh <laughs> it was a very small investment and now i'm and it's the very it's the biggest headache that i'm dealing with mm -hmm. i just can't make to make this one just big sale and offer them an exit just because of that headache uh yeah. you know you, you marry into a big problem with this uh, and just because you were so desperate two years ago for, for, for funding for this one project two years ago, now half of your day is spent just turning out fires for, from, from, uh, uh, from someone who's not even adding value to today's efforts. Yeah. So uh, yes, you're right. You, you, uh, it's, sometimes it's great to hear a no because you don't want that person. But when you're desperate and and uh, and you just need the funding, back then I should have taken a loan rather than mm -hmm. you know taking taking his money. Now I have to deal with the consequence. If I had a CFO back then, CFO would have said, "Don't take his money." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so so yeah, it's trust the experts, and uh, and I'm not the expert on that matter. I'm learning every day. Wow, Mac, thank you so much for being here today. I feel like we could talk for four hours about all of this. Please feel welcome to come visit us and to come speak with us anytime we uh, do our conversations for the future twice a month, uh, excluding the summertime and excluding the holidays, uh, Western holidays. And uh, But anytime you'd like to come back, uh, consider us here an open platform for you. Your expertise has really, I, for me personally, I am so inspired by what you just taught us. And, uh, and I thank our audience also for being here today. So we're going to wrap up your sex, your segment now, Mac, unless you have, uh, do you have any final words for us before we let you go? Uh, no, I just want to thank you for you know giving me a voice and a and uh, giving my community a voice on your platform, and that was unheard of like five or six years ago when I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I started talking about diversity, I mean, when when uh, uh, even the own Explore Mars Humans to Mars conference, you know, they sneak in a woman on a panel, they pat themselves on the back for being so inclusive. And now you look at everyone today; it's it's the collective effort of everyone acknowledging hard work of indiv of individuals and teams is is what is paying off. And and it's slow; you don't see that progress. But when you look back at 2016, 2017, and you look at the panels and what they looked like, and even the words and structure of words, of what yeah. they said—it's like watching an old movie. And and you see panels like this, you see inclusion like this. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it really uh, you know makes me feel seen, heard, and welcome. Yes. And, no, I think uh, I think that's great. And and you know I want to you know emphasize what what you're doing is like the gold standard for what space should be doing for outreach. You know, you made a comment about, um, oh, they wanted me to show the people without limbs or the sad stories. And, you know, that's a little tongue in cheek, but that's kind of true. But like, there's such an opportunity here for space to reach out and give hope and inspiration. Um, and it's just so exciting to see it actually happening. Um, in in places that need it but we still deal with that we're trying to do bring sure. all these young uh, creators to uh to, to mexico to cosimo and to, to play del carmen to do cave diving and do marine biology there and to try to get it funded i'm hearing things like well i could probably help you if we market this as they're going to go discover the secret mayan uh you know uh, treasures or stuff like that we're like no this is 
science and outreach. What is this? They're like, yeah, that won't sell. I need a aliens and Mayans and and, and stuff like that. That 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 that's what. Uh, so so even it's not just in those cultures and those languages. We're still running into that here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but yeah, the use of language, like like you said, um, and uh, uh, and thanks for catching that. That that was uh, that was a tough pill to swallow, and I'm glad you acknowledged that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I am excited for the future of space because, yeah. especially now after hearing that the other side of the world is also growing its space presence and might even beat us to uh, to the first lunar habitat uh, privately funded. That's really amazing, really exciting and inspirational as well. Yeah, I'm excited. 